Okay, good afternoon. My name is David Haig, and the title of this talk is Generating Waveform Families Using Multitone Sinusoidal Frequency Modulation. Now, the goal of this work is to design a family of waveforms that occupy a common band of frequencies and possess desirable auto and cross correlation properties. And we're going to do this using the multitone SFM model, which simply stated is a constant amplitude, specially efficient waveform model that possesses a discrete set of design parameters that we can adjust on the fly to synthesize waveforms with the characteristics that we want. It's a brief outline, so I've already given you an introduction. Next, I'll get into the waveform signal model. Then I'll introduce the multitone sinusoidal FM model. Then I'll talk about how we can generate families of multitone SFM waveforms. I'll demonstrate these methods using some illustrative design examples. And finally, I'll conclude. Now, our waveform is a standard complex exponential with instantaneous phase phi of t and some real positive amplitude tapering function a of t. Now, in this talk, for mathematical expressions, I'll assume a rectangular window function, but practical examples will use a two-key window. The modulation function, which maps the waveform's instantaneous frequency as a function of time, is defined as the first time derivative of the phase divided by 2 pi. I'll assume we use a match filter or correlation receiver to process echoes. And that means we're interested in the ambiguity function. And in this case, I'm doing a more general expression which correlates one waveform with the Doppler shifted versions of another, so it's a cross ambiguity function. And if we take the zero Doppler cut of this, we'll get the auto and cross correlation functions. Here are the design metrics that we'll consider in this talk. For the auto correlation function, we'll be interested in the integrated side lobe ratio, which simply stated is the ratio of the area under the side lobe region of the auto correlation function divided by the area under the main lobe region. For the cross-correlation function, since we don't have a main lobe to speak of, generally speaking, we'll be interested in just the side lobe region, which is the entire cross-correlation function, and we want the area under that. We'll also be interested in the Armis bandwidth, which is this measure of the spread of the waveform spectra about its centroid F0, the inverse of which determines the area under the main lobe of the autocorrelation function. So we'll be using this arm as bandwidth as a type of constraint in our waveform optimization problems. Here is the multitone SFM model. So simply stated, its modulation function is expressed as a finite Fourier series. I have my set of Fourier coefficients, a sub k. And in this case, I'm using cosines, but I could easily introduce sines or interchange them as I wish. If I integrate and multiply by 2 pi, I get the instantaneous phase. And that has a carrier term plus this weighted superposition of sine functions weighted by these modulation indices. And these are a function of those Fourier coefficients. These modulation indices are the discrete set of parameters that we're going to use to modify the waveform's characteristics. And lastly, if I take e to the j of this expression, I get the waveform time series. Now this is a bit of a mathematically cumbersome expression to work with, but as it turns out, there's a way to simplify it and get convenient analytical expressions for things that we care about, such as the spectrum and ambiguity function of this waveform. And you do that by utilizing generalized Bessel functions, generalized in that they accept a multidimensional argument. So here's our rectangularly windowed multitone SFM model. And if I invoke what is known as the Jacobi Anger expansion for generalized Bessel functions, I get the following complex Fourier series representation for the multitone SFM. So here's our carrier term, our complex Fourier harmonics, and the Fourier coefficients, which this is a double-sided Fourier series, is given by the mth order generalized Bessel function with argument alpha sub k, the modulation indices. And this notation is just shorthand for the following multidimensional uh, Bessel function argument. Now with these, I now can solve for exact closed form analytical expressions for things like the spectrum and ambiguity function of the multitone SFM. And so here are some of those results. In fact, the derivations for these are described in a paper that I just submitted for IEEE transactions on aerospace and electronic systems. So the derivations can be found there. So here's what these waveforms look like. In the following example, I initialize the Fourier coefficients a sub k using independent, identically distributed, 
Gaussian random variables. And then I scale them so that they occupy a desired swept bandwidth of frequencies. This results in a pseudo-random modulation function, which is what I'm showing in the upper left panel, the spectrogram of the waveform. Now note, the modulation function is, is expressed as a finite Fourier series, and a finite Fourier series is infinitely differentiable. This means that that modulation function is smooth. There are no transient-like artifacts in the modulation function. What this means for the spectrum is that the majority of the waveform's energy is concentrated in a specific compact band of frequencies with very little energy elsewhere. And that's what I'm showing in the upper right panel. Now, I used Carson's bandwidth rule to compute a band of frequencies where the majority of the waveform's energy should be concentrated. And that's equal to the swept bandwidth plus the highest frequency component of the modulation function, and I'm calling that W. And I compute this phi of W, the spectral efficiency of the waveform. It's effectively measuring the ratio of the waveform's energy in that band W over the waveform's total energy. And as you can see in the upper right, the multitone SFM spectral efficiency is 99.54%. Almost all the energy is in that band with very little elsewhere. Now as a means of comparison, I also generated a BPSK waveform with the same range resolution, and I plotted its spectrum in the blue. And you can see those spectral side lobes roll off much slower with increasing frequency, and as a result of this, the spectral efficiency is much lower, roughly 89%. Now the pseudo-random nature of the modulation function produces an ambiguity function shape that is thumbtack-like. That is to say, a main lobe centered at the origin whose width and range is inversely proportional to the bandwidth, and width in Doppler is inversely proportional to the pulse length. The rest of the waveform's ambiguity function volume, which is bounded, is spread evenly in the range Doppler plane, resulting in a pedestal of side lobes. To reduce the pedestal height, you need to increase the time bandwidth product. This spreads that volume over a larger region in the range Doppler plane. And in the lower right, I have a plot of the autocorrelation function, the zero Doppler cut of our ambiguity function. And you can see that pedestal of side lobes. Roughly, the peak side lobes are about 16 or 17 dB. Now, if you realize sets of these random coefficients, you can synthesize a series of waveforms with good auto and cross correlation properties with one another. And I detailed this for a paper in the 2017 IEEE radar conference in Seattle. But what we want to do here is we actually want to modify the design coefficients so as to further refine the characteristics of these waveforms. So in this design example, I'm going to modify the modulation indices alpha sub k to reduce the integrated side lobe ratio while maintaining roughly the same main lobe width, thus preserving range resolution. For waveform parameters, I have a time bandwidth product of 100 and 64 design coefficients initialized to synthesize a thumbtack-like waveform. The optimization problem is modifying alpha sub k to reduce the integrated side lobe ratio subject to a constraint on the RMS bandwidth. Recall that the RMS bandwidth, the inverse of that value, determines the area under the main lobe of the autocorrelation function. So effectively with this constraint, I'm saying keep the resulting RMS bandwidth roughly within some tolerance level of the initial RMS bandwidth, thus preserving range resolution. You can express RMS bandwidth in this exact expression in terms of the modulation indices, and I'm detailing how you can solve for that, that equation in an upcoming paper. So here's the result of this optimization. The blue curve is the autocorrelation function for the initial waveform. The black curve is the autocorrelation function for the resulting optimal waveform. Very clearly from this figure, you see that the side lobes were substantially reduced, in some cases as much as 15 or even 20 dB, all while preserving the main lobe width of the resulting autocorrelation function. Now it's important to note here, I didn't reduce this pedestal of side lobes by increasing the time bandwidth product. I did it by modifying the modulation indices and preserving that time bandwidth product. Right, so that's an encouraging result, but what we want to do is now generate a family of waveforms with good autocorrelation function properties, but additionally good cross-correlation properties. How do we do that? Well, we can do that using the following multi-objective optimization problem. 
This optimization problem seeks to modify the set of modulation indices for P waveforms to reduce the integrated cellular ratio and cross-correlation function area while still maintaining the same autocorrelation function main lobe widths. For this design example, here are the following waveform parameters. Each waveform has a time bandwidth product of 100. Each waveform employs 64 design coefficients and I'll optimize for a family of two waveforms. Now the optimization problem has a few components. The integrated side lobe ratio controls autocorrelation function properties, and the cross-correlation function properties are controlled by the area under each cross-correlation function. Note that each objective function is normalized by their initialized values. This simply normalizes the multi-objective function to unity for the initial set of design coefficients. Also note, I've included weights to place emphasis on either auto or cross-correlation function properties. I've also included the RMS bandwidth constraint to ensure that the autocorrelation function main lobe would stay roughly the same as the initialized versions. Now over the next several slides, I'll show results from this optimization problem where I've changed the weights to place emphasis on either auto or cross-correlation function properties. So in this first example, I'm showing a case where I place equal emphasis on all of the objective functions, equal weighting for auto and cross-correlation properties. Now the diagonal plots are the autocorrelation functions, and the off-diagonal plot is the cross-correlation function. And for this case, it's quite clear you can see that the side lobes have been reduced for all three cases. A little bit of side lobes popping up near these main lobes, but otherwise, generally speaking, the ISRs are improved, and the cross-correlation area is reduced as well. Now in this example, I'm placing emphasis on the cross-correlation function, and I do that by weighing the cross-correlation function weight 10 times more than the autocorrelation function weight. And as a result, the cross-correlation function is notably improved. In some cases, these side lobes were reduced on the order of about 15 or even 20 dB. Now this comes at a cost. The autocorrelation function side lobes were notably increased. However, since they were weighted so little in the optimization problem, it did not substantially degrade the multi-objective function because we're improving the cross-correlation function property so much. Now I can do the opposite and place emphasis on the autocorrelation function properties and less so on the cross-correlation function. Here are those results. As expected, the autocorrelation function properties are substantially improved. However, the cross-correlation really didn't change all that much. We were placing such little emphasis on it in the optimization problem that any change was going to be negligible. Now, this design method is readily extendable to a larger number of waveforms. In this particular design example, I optimized for four waveforms. In this case, I place emphasis on the autocorrelation function properties, which again are the plots on the diagonal, and the cross-correlation functions are the off-diagonals. As you can see from the figure, the autocorrelation function side lobes are substantially reduced, and since we didn't place much emphasis on the cross-correlation functions, their side lobes weren't notably changed. Now, I use this for illustrative purposes, but I can easily extend this to even larger numbers of waveforms. I've done this for 10 waveforms and even ran my machine over the weekend and generated 100 waveforms. So to conclude, the Multitone SFM is a constant amplitude, spectrally efficient waveform model. Optimizing over a set of P modulation indices produces a family of P waveforms with desirable auto and cross-correlation properties. For future work, I'd like to investigate whether or not this family of waveforms closely approaches or obeys some sort of Welch-like bound, similar to that of phase-coded waveforms. With that, I'd like to conclude my talk. Thank you for your time and attention. I look forward to answering your questions in the interactive session later on in the conference.